I'd like to address the institutional legal question of uh, where and how to make a political, that is a mutually agreed um, progress or a solution, or for a political solution on this trade and climate change uh, interaction. And more specifically, I'd like to question two conventional views. Uh, the first one is that for any such political agreement, uh, we need the consent of, of all 153 WTO members. That's one view that I'd like to question. The second view that I'd like to question is that for any such political agreement to be effective, it needs to be written in the form of hard law or state-made law. That's another thing I would like to, uh, to question. Now, I'm making one assumption here, and that is that it is better for negotiators for politicians, for experts to get together and solve these questions rather than have the appellate body solve the questions. This is an assumption. Some people may disagree, but I think the appellate body itself may also be quite happy to see a negotiated solution rather than to have interpret, apply rules that were created when climate change was not an issue at all. Now, a, a final preliminary point, I'm completely agnostic as to what this political agreement should cover. Because I think it could cover uh, rules on how to address the interface between climate change and trade. It could set out a code of good practice on when, how to do border tax adjustment. Uh, an earlier speaker addressed that. It could also inc include an agreement on you know, when to take trade restrictive measures and when they are necessary to, to deal with climate change, or it could be an agreement providing for the opposite, that you will not impose trade restrictions because your climate change regimes are equivalent. could be an equivalence uh, deal. Now, with, with, with those preliminaries uh, set out, first question is, do we really need the consent of all 153 countries to move the ball forward politically, not judicially? You may have seen the story last week in Inside US Trade where the US was, I think, with many other countries saying, well, to, to conclude Doha, to do something post-Doha, it would be fantastic if we could do plurilaterals, but to do so is basically impossible. Why is it impossible? For two reasons, and the US and others have uh, repeated these reasons. First reason is that to have a plurilateral added to the WTO treaty, to Annex 4, you need the consensus of all WTO members. Okay, so even if we have a deal amongst 25 WTO members, to add that to Annex 4 of the WTO Treaty, all 153 would have to agree. Problem. Second point that is often referred to is that if we do this outside of the WTO, it means we would have to give whatever benefits we exchange to everyone. Otherwise, we would violate MFN. So if we want to keep this a genuine plurilateral, we would need to seek a WTO waiver. And as you know, to get a WTO waiver, you need to have consensus. That's the practice. So again, we can't do anything because of the WTO consensus requirement. Now, I'd like to make two points, and I'm not entirely sure of them, but I think it's at least worth raising them in this context. The first is that I believe we can do plurilaterals, political agreements, without the consent of everyone. And secondly, that you know, even if we do this, and not everyone has agreed to it, uh, this can impact WTO adjudication. Okay. Now, how could we have a plurilateral without the consent of all 153? I think by not putting it in Annex 4, obviously, otherwise we need consensus, but by thinking of different legal avenues to make this effective. The first one is, of course, but I know it, it's unlikely to work, as you know, to amend, to interpret the WTO treaty, you can ask for majority votes. So you could construe an Annex 5 and put it there, uh, but that's more theoretical than anything else. Secondly, and more realistic, I think, you could add it, that agreement into your schedules. Countries who have signed off on that agreement could add it in their respective schedules. A bit like we've seen in the telecom um, sector, where certain countries, not all of them, have made specific commitments. And finally, and I think most logically, nothing tells us we should put this into the WTO treaty, whatever agreement we could reach politically. We could still do it at the WTO, but not necessarily within the WTO single package. We could even do it elsewhere. 
we could meet in Washington, India, wherever, and, and, and strike a deal. And yet, in my view, that could still influence WTO adjudication. I mean, the deal could be subject to the DSU. It could be you know, not enforceable under the DSU. So that's one thing. I think there's mechanisms to make this happen. But the second thing is, if we assume we have this plurilateral treaty or document outside of the WTO treaty, how could it still influence WTO appellate body interpretations? Now, I've, I've been arguing for a long time that even bilateral deals or plurilateral agreements should influence how we interpret the WTO treaty as between parties to that bilateral or plurilateral agreement. Now, the, the latest we have on this from the appellate body is um, their ruling in an EC aircraft. And I think they've, they've put the puzzle um, correctly, namely we have to find or make a delicate balance between giving effect to obligations, treaties that may have been concluded outside of the WTO, but at the same time ensure a harmonious interpretation, a harmonious uh, approach to WTO law uh, itself. Now, harmonious interpretation of WTO law, I, I think it's a, it's a myth to, to somehow imagine that all WTO law applies equally to everyone. We know that there's all kinds of differential rules that apply differentially to many WTO members. I mean, just ask China. They will explain how that has worked out. So there is a way to do this, and there is a way for this to influence WTO adjudication. Now, the second point, and trying to stick to my 10 minutes here, the second point is that I think we could even do it in something that is not hard law. We could even do it in soft law. We could even do it in standards, whereby non-state actors could actually um, have a say. And even then, it could still influence how the WTO uh, decides these kinds of, of issues. Two recent examples. In the US clove cigarettes case, the panel referred to WHO guidelines that are not legally binding. And not every WTO member is a party to uh, the WHO. Another case, US Tuna, they refer to TBT committee guidelines. They are not binding, but they had a, a definite impact on the result. And they even found that panel, in my view, quite convincingly, that <coughs> resolutions under the, uh, under the Dolphin Protection Convention or international standards that WTO members uh, must follow or give reasons uh, why they have not been following them. So one could imagine the establishment of something of an international standard on trade and climate change as well. Now, what would that international standard have to meet for it to be valid under the TBT? They've defined it with reference to three elements. It has to be a standard. It has to be adopted by a recognized st uh, standardization organization. And it has to be made available to the public. Now, for it to be a standard, it has to be adopted by consensus. That's what this panel found, the appellate body found earlier, that you don't even need consensus. And the, standard, the recognized standard organization has to be open to all WTO members, open to all WTO members, not signed or ratified by all WTO members. In that case, only 14 states had ratified that Dolphin Convention program. And finally, it has to be made available to the public, which is, in essence, a, a transparency requirement. So if we follow that definition in the TUNA panel, what does that mean for any possible political agreement or standard on trade and climate change? First of all, the recognized standardization body must not necessarily be a, a fully public or state-run body. It could involve non-state actors. Okay. Secondly, it doesn't have to be binding, that standard. It can be soft law, it can be guidelines. Thirdly, not all 153 members must agree to it. It has to be open to all WTO members, but it's enough if uh, a certain number, in the TUNA case 14, were uh, or are party to it. And yet, and that's where it becomes really interesting, even if not all WTO members have signed off on that standard, on the TBT Article 2.5, you could use it as a, a safe haven to fend off complaints made by WTO members that didn't sign off on the standard, because it applies, or the international standard applies vis-a-vis -vis all WTO members. Last point is that if you think of it, it is easier to adopt this kind of international standard, which has huge relevance under TBT, 
outside of the WTO than it is to adopt WTO amendments or plurilaterals. And here I would refer to this requirement of what needs to be done for you to have an international standard as the requirement of a thick consensus. What we would need in the WTO for an amendment is just a thin consent. What, how is a thick consensus different? It's in a way easier. I've explained it, right? You don't need the consent of all 153 members. There's no veto for any particular participant. It's a consensus. And it's quite interesting to see how consensus is defined in the standards world. It doesn't mean unanimity. Now, at the same time, and that's where I think it becomes interesting, this idea of a thick consensus is more difficult or it requires more than your ordinary WTO amendment because you have to follow certain process requirements. You have to be inclusive and transparent in how you adopt the standard. You have to be coherent when you enact it. So ultimately, it raises the very interesting difference in adopting WTO amendments as opposed to international standards. I'll, I'll stop here, but the final point that I think is or could be made is uh, going back to this idea of MFN. I'm convinced that a lot of the agreements one could conclude in this field would not even exchange concessions, so MFN wouldn't be triggered. And if we do see deeper integration in some of these plurilaterals, I'm not sure that GATT Article 3 MFN applies to everything WTO members do. The scope of Article 1 MFN is limited essentially to border duties and internal taxes and regulations. MFN does not apply to everything a WTO member does. And finally, I'm even convinced that a lot of these deals you could see happening, plurilaterally or even bilaterally, countries would be quite happy to extend those on an MFN basis. Thank you.